Hello ladies and gents, today we're going to go through the seven deadly sins of narcissism. Sin number one is shamelessness. Shamelessness, the narcissist has no normal sense of healthy shame whatsoever. If they have a choice, they'll always choose feelings of guilt over any feelings of shame that they might feel because that means that they can always say, well, I meant for the best but it just didn't work out that way, or I meant for the best, or my actions, my words were misinterpreted. You'll frequently hear them use that as a defense. They hate to be criticized. This is a part of their shamelessness. If you start doing what their superego should be doing for them, like a normal healthy person saying, hey, I'm acting like a bit of a dick here, they will loathe you for it. They'll attack you for it because you're attacking their perfect, unquestionable, narcissistic self-image, the false self. Number two is magical thinking. The narcissist is an expert at magical thinking. They have to go through all kinds of mental gymnastics, all kinds of infantile ways of thinking in order to maintain their self-image that they're perfect, that they've never done anything wrong, and that they're incapable of ever doing any sort of wrong. In essence, they need to see themselves as being completely perfect. Given the chance, they'll use that magical thinking if anything does go wrong to project it outwards onto you, onto their codependent partner, the echo, the co-narcissist. Number three, you'll notice when dealing with a narcissist an appalling level of arrogance. That arrogance can become quite malignant and toxic and can also manifest in bullying. They will bully other people if their self-esteem has come down a little bit and they need to bring it up they'll frequently bring it up higher again by deliberately targeting and bullying other people in their environment. They're extremely arrogant, and very bullying. Number four, the fourth deadly sin of the narcissist is envy. They envy and hate when other people have achieved more than them. You'll never hear them offering praise when somebody else has done well. They will attack the people who have done well in their environment because they are absolutely green with envy. Number five, the fifth deadly sin is entitlement. You'll see that in the narcissist environment, if you are not on message, if you're not on script, if you're not doing what they want you to do, they will actually see that as an attack. Anybody who doesn't go along with what they want in their entitled fantasy is deemed awkward or difficult or toxic, in fact. Number six is exploitation. All narcissistic relationships are marked by a very, very high level of exploitative behavior, particularly nasty exploitative behavior. They don't do fairness. They don't do horizontal, horizontal transactions. They do do vertical transactions with winners and losers. And guess what? They're the winner, which makes you the not, the, the not winner. And finally, the seventh deadly sin of the narcissist is dreadfully bad boundaries. These people have terrible, terrible boundaries. They cannot tell the difference between you and themselves. And typically, they will break the boundary relationship frequently. Their motto is, you exist to please me, or you do not exist at all. When we're talking about the personality disorder of narcissism and we're particularly discussing narcissistic abuse, it's useful to see it in terms of broad philosophical concepts, I think. It helps people to understand and it means that we can, we can detect narcissism and we can detect narcissistic abuse without having to hold a lot of very complicated ideas inside of our heads. Um, and one of them is a very strong desire to control the narrative, control the story, control the perception. These people are all about artifice. These people are all about the surface. They're only interested in the superficial. They're really only interested in the emotional responses that they can gather from others. This, I think, is the particular permutation of their unique autism spectrum disordered response to life because they weren't given proper love and attention in childhood. They weren't given proper interaction, so they weren't able to develop normal communication skills. I think this could be one of the reasons why a lot of people are very confused between the boundary between autism spectrum disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, because though they are different, uh, formed in different environments and manifest in completely different ways, they're absolutely different. Narcissism 
looks like autism sometimes. Narcissism clones and cloaks itself as autism sometimes. Um, it, I think one of the things that kept me in my last relationship for as long as I did was I spent a lot of that time believing I was with um, a female autist, somebody who was on the autism spectrum, uh, high functioning, but fundamentally just was incapable of grasping certain elements of communication. At one point, I even went down the route of exploring the possibility that she had brain damage. Such was the oddness, creepiness, weirdness, uh, discomfort of living with her and communicating with her on a daily basis. Now, if we take, as I said, if we take a broad philosophical look, that means that I think we have a better way of looking at this. You don't want to get caught up. You don't want to do a degree in uh, psychoanalysis. You don't want to get caught up in the details. You want to know what am, what's the type of personality I'm dealing with and what, pers what behaviors am I dealing with? So I can say, okay, this looks like narcissism. This looks like narcissistic abuse. Because you, like me, you don't want to be another one of those people who's just out there calling everything that they don't like narcissism and every time you have an argument with somebody you go oh they're a narcissist and that's how you write them off you don't want to do that because it makes you look stupid obviously and it also renders the term narcissism meaningless so then when somebody is authentically narcissistically abused people kind of go no oh, here we go here's another claim the boy or girl who cried wolf for the 15th millionth time we're not we don't want to hear it anymore so we want to be specific when it is what it is we also need to not uh uh, sort of recoil from that we need to be able to go that's what it is and this is how I know so a little bit of theory um, hopefully not too boring um, but let's look at the formation of the narcissist in childhood they're only getting it's not that they're getting no attention it's not they're getting no interaction so the brain basically it, it, it actually does look kind of like a kind of brain damage the brain doesn't do empathy the brain doesn't do body language communication the brain in its earliest formative years where it needed a, a, an adult who is interested in looking at them you know eye contact is so important skin contact is so important facial expressions tone this is what in neurotypical normal families is what happens you look at the baby and you go ooh ah and you make weird noises and the baby goes ee and you go ee and you you copy you echo and the baby is going it doesn't think these words obviously but it's thinking something primarily like i make noise and the big human with the food makes noise this is good i have power and so it's like a, a drive to power, a, a drive to manifest your will in the world as a little baby. I want this. Take this. Now, nah, put it in my mouth. Oh, blah, blah, you know, all of that. If you can do that, you're developing. You're growing. If you don't get the opportunity to do that, you don't. So ex that's pretty straightforward, right? This is where it gets a little bit weird, uh, more theoretical extrapolate that forward then from a baby literally an infant lying on its back it can't do anything it just it need it, it can't even crawl it's pre eight months old so there's it's barely crawling now extrapolate what i just said forward to being a toddler to being like three four five years old and you are getting attention you are getting face-to-face -face contact you are getting strokes you are getting e ah ooh, and echoing gibberish coos effectively now there's words, you're like, what are you doing? I'm doing a thing. What thing are you doing? Ooh, that's clever. And the child knows that that's not how you talk to other adults. When you and other adults talk, it's, rrr, 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 it's serious stuff. But when you're talking to me, you use like a higher pitched tone of voice. You, you talk about stuff that I am doing. What if I'm only, imagine it's me. You're the uh, psychiatrist and it's me. And now you shrink me exactly as I am with the same face and the same jumper on, but I'm a baby. Isn't that weird? And the parents in my environment are only, they do, they're not ignoring me. They're not giving me the cold, no contact thing. But what they are doing is they're only giving me the echoing, reassuring facial expression, touch both physical and symbolic and emotional when I am performing and when I am acting in accordance with a very narrow band of behaviors that they never tell me what those narrow band of behaviors are, 
but I learn them because all the time I'm just like, how do I, apart from learning language and apart from learning how to move my hands and feet, the big thing that my brain is doing is like, how do I win approval? How do I win approval from mummy and daddy? How do I get them to smile? How do I get them to, that love that they give me, it feels so good. How do I get more of that? What do I do to, to win more attention, to win more love? So they coerce me passively and implicitly to perform. And when I say perform, I mean it becomes transactional. The nurse, this is my, um, my hypothesis. I don't think it's there in the, in the research literature, but I don't think it's wild. It's not like I have wild ideas. This is not one of them. I think most people would be like, yeah, that's implied. Most psychologists, psychoanalysts would, would say, yeah, this is implied. So I am only going to receive love in this very uh, love echo, goo goo gaga, reinforcement, the things I need to grow, to grow my brain when I'm doing a very narrow band of things, which is I need to be performing. It can't just be me being me. I have to do something. I have to um, be something that is not natural for me to do or be. Me just sat there like a three or four year old doing what three or four year olds do is not gonna, is not gonna cut it. So I need parents who are, to create narcissistic personality disorder, weirdly demanding, strangely indifferent and non-empathic and only offering, they don't ever offer me empathy. They don't ever offer me love. Love is not part of the, the protocol, though I may try to, as a child, interpret it as love. I said before, what do I need to do to win my parents' love? That's what I'm thinking about. It's not what they're offering. The parents in this environment, so shrink me back again, I'm a tiny baby with exactly the same face and head, just like big head on a baby's body with the same blue jumper. And I'm in that environment and I'm going, how do I win love? And I never win love. What I win is attention and maybe applause. So I start to hardwire my brain when I'm in a very young age, at my most neuroplastic age, to performance and applause. So in a normal family, I'd show up and go, yeah, you know, like little, uh, little three, four year olds, if you spent time with them, like little thug pirates, little drunk thug pirates, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. they pick a thing up, throw it on the floor. And if they're happy and, and in elation, they'll like make a stance and go, hoo, hoo, like little, little cavemen and cavewomen. And in a normal environment, they would either not be punished for that or they might get attention for that. They're like the parents would be like, oh, what did you do? Was that a thing that you did? Oh, well done, you little thug. And they'd recognize that. For the narcissist, for me in that environment, I get nothing for those behaviors or punished for those behaviors. And it amounts to the same thing in, in terms of what I'm talking about. If I'm gonna grow as a narcissist, I either need to be ignored or punished because they are the same thing to a small toddler. No love is a punishment. Punishment is a punishment. Punishment, at least I got attention. But if there's just if the parents just ignore me for it, that's actually in some respects worse. So I'm going to learn that I have to perform and do, and do tricks within a very certain narrow band of behavior to get that attention from them that I interpret as love. It's actually applause. I don't think, not, because narcissistic personality disorder, all of the long words and the theory and the acronyms and the psychoanalytic you know, labels are fine and they're necessary. But remember, the myth of Narcissus is a really handsome dude from uh, the state of Sparta uh, uh, looking at himself. He's a, he's a, in different myths, he's like a, he's a hunter in some myths and in others he's, he's the undead, um, but he's really handsome and he becomes, he becomes enamored with himself and his own reflection and he becomes cruel and he hurts the women who pursue him because he's beautiful. And eventually this gets back to a goddess. It gets back to the goddess of love, Aphrodite, and she sends down a manifestation of herself to punish him. And the punishment is you love yourself so much to you. Okay. After a long day of hunting in the Greek heat, he's thirsty and he arrives at a pool and he reaches down to drink water to satisfy his thirst. And he sees his own reflection in the pool and he becomes totally transfixed by the beautiful being staring back at him. And then he's trapped. He's trapped there forever. So the myth has a lot of connotations that there's a kind of mortification, a narcissistic mortification. 
you're, you're, it's, it's death, basically. The narcissist is not truly alive. They're frozen. They're frozen in time. They're frozen in a moment that goes on forever. A moment of perfect megalo, megalomaniacal, megalomania, megalomania, megalomaniacal, thank you, megalomaniacal moment. Megalomaniacal in this sense. Obviously, if you're a megalomaniac, you want to rule the world. You want to rule the world. You want to be number one. Megalomania, um, uh, according to some uh, psychiatric theory, is actually us in the womb because we rule that world. When we're in the womb, the matrix, as, as that's what the word matrix means, is the womb. When we're in the pod and we're in the womb, we rule the world. We're blue pilled. We're living a blue pill, if you like the matrix movie, we're living uh, Cypher's life, the, the Judas of that story who agrees to going back into the, into the pod, back into the matrix to live life as a rock star and to enjoy wonderful things. That's us in the womb. Then we come out of the womb. We're like, Hey, everything is saying no to me right now where everything was yes before. Well, there wasn't even a no or a yes. My needs were satisfied before I even knew I had a need. It was just endless bliss. And now I'm having to deal with this shitty reality. So that's the megalomania that we aspire to. So the um, megalomaniacal state that we're trying to get back to is that of the matrix, is that of the pod, is that of being back inside of mother in utero. For all humans, the narcissist is trapped in the idea that they can maintain that. The neurotypical person deals with the heartache that they can't. They just go, well, that's just not going to be my life. So <laughs> that's, and you just deal with it. That's growth. That's individuation, that's humility, that's a sense of humor, that's stoicism. All of these great philosophical traditions come from that moment, the moment of, which is, I, I'm not the king, I'm not God, because you are both king, you're the empress, you're the god, you're the goddess, you're everything. And you are everything in utero. Everything is you, you are everything, and everything is you. Sometimes when people are obsessed with love and they get amorous narcissism, um, and they're try what they're trying to do is get back to that in utero megalomaniacal state of being the king. You are everything and everything is you. Well, actually what they're saying is you are me. I've consumed you. We're in perfect union. Apart from what like, the obvious Freudian sexual overtones of, of trying to return to the womb between a man and a woman, as in the, the act of sex, there is this desire for supreme power the supreme narcissistic elation. That's why I'm very, very suspicious of people who are obsessed with being in loving relationships. There is something fundamentally narcissistic about it. I want a person who will love me forever and ever and ever. Like uh, Galadriel, when we see the dark side of the characters in Lord of the Rings, anybody who comes close to the ring, it brings out the worst of them. It brings out their shadow side. And Galadriel is this beautiful, kind, but strong warrior elf queen until she's close to the ring. And then we see that she's vain. The dark side of her, her unconscious, her shadow side is vain and tyrannical and bullying and violent. And she wants to take revenge on the world. We all have that in us. We all have that desire in us because, well, the world's disappointing and it's full of disappointing people. And she's, I think she says something like, I'll be as beautiful as the stormy sea and she manifests as this sort of purely chaotic uh, siren mermaid sea entity the sea representing in uh, Jungian psychology and dream psychology the emotions uh, the unconscious and sexual energy and she wants to rage like the sea and conquer the world and all will kneel before me so we have that megalomania so the 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 good kittens of the world the good cats have gone that's crazy you can't do that because there's a bunch of other humans here there's other individuals here so the neurotypicals normals or people who who can espouse a good philosophy of life are going oh other people also have needs oh i must wait my turn oh okay whereas the narcissists are literally stuck inside the mum. they're stuck in the matrix Matrix means womb. Do you know the word matrix is used multiple times in the Bible? I only found that out recently. Isn't that interesting? So 
where does that leave us? It leaves us with an understanding that where we see a child trying to go back to m not mummy, he's not going back to mummy as an individual in psychiatric terms, that would be an object, not mummy as primary object. This is pre-egoic. This is before you're born. So when we say it's infantile, and you go, yeah, yeah, narcissists are like toddlers, which I've said, and I, I think it's true. I think it, there's an important way in which we can see temper tantrums and stamping of feet and that's mine and you don't take it. No, I want all the toys. Yeah, we see that. And we see infantile, like an infant bawling, just screaming and bawling. I didn't get my own way and I can't form words. I can't negotiate to get it. So rah, I'm just going to scream. But even even smaller, even younger than that, as a fetus. They're trying to go back to a fetus-like state of just pure bliss. I am everything, everything is me, all my needs are met. And where you see a deviation from that, they get hostile, they get aggressive, they get upset, they get judgmental, they start condemning people. If they have the power to, unfortunately, they'll start killing people trying to regain that balance, trying to regain their sense of, to compensate for that, that self-esteem has gone down. Oh, you're no longer in the matrix. You're losing control of the matrix. You lose control of the, no, I'll take it back by force. Rah! That's what you see. So hopefully that's given you a, a, a new way, a fresh way of looking at this. So you can go, ah, okay, this is truly narcissistic behavior because anybody can have a bad day. And just because somebody is vain and selfish, doesn't really mean you're dealing with narcissistic personality disorder. When you see someone who fundamentally can't deal with adult reality, they cannot, they lack the capacity to see that there are other human beings in the world and you see their weakness, you see their fragility, you see that vulnerability and you see them as a, a toddler, a baby, and as a fetus trying to win back the megalomaniacal God, King state of being in the matrix, that means you're dealing with true narcissistic personality disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Please do stay very grateful for everything that you have. Cheers. Folks, if you enjoyed that, there are more episodes for you to watch right here. Please click on that. If you want to subscribe to me, do it here. And here is a PDF for you that is completely free.